Usually when we think about Buddhist wisdom, we think about things that are fairly abstract. Emptiness, not self, dependent core arising. But the Buddha often explained wisdom in much simpler terms. For instance, there's a verse where he says, the wise man sees that there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness. He'll abandon the lesser one for the sake of the greater. It sounds very simple, common sense. But then, of course, common sense sometimes is hard to come by. It's good to be reminded. There's also a passage where he says that wisdom can be measured by how you deal with two situations. One, things that you like to do that give bad results. You know how to talk yourself out of that. And things you don't like to do or are difficult to do but give good results, and you learn how to give yourself the energy, convince yourself that you really want to do these things. So wisdom for him is pragmatic. It comes down to the question of what's worth doing. And a lot of the practice is learning how to straighten out your ideas about what's worth doing. Because all too often we go by what gives results quickly. But quick results and good results are not necessarily the same thing. And something that gives pleasure immediately may give pain in the long term, and vice versa. And so when you're dealing with something painful in the practice, something that's difficult in the practice, you've got to think about the long term. You've got to give yourself energy. You've got to, as the Buddha said, generate desire. Because if the practice was simply a matter of trading suffering for happiness, we'd all go for it. But there are many aspects of the practice that are difficult and require that you give up things that are going to give you pleasure in the, in the short term. So what do you do? You learn how to talk to yourself. You try to figure out what will get you to want to do the practice. Sometimes heedfulness works when you think about the dangers that come from a mind that's not trained. This is where it's useful sometimes to go down to old folks' homes and see this is what happens to people who don't train their minds. Not that the aging is what happens, it's the mental illnesses that you see. the people whose minds are out of control. The strength of the body has left them, and then the strength of the mind has left them as well. And you don't want to be in a situation like that, both for your own sake and for the sake of the people who will be looking after you. Or you can think thoughts of compassion for yourself. Think about all the suffering you've been through. Remember the Buddha's image of looking at the ocean and realizing that you've shed more tears than that over these many, many lifetimes. Then there's water in the ocean. And how many more oceans do you want to cry? If you really have some compassion for yourself, you want to practice. You can also make the practice a point of pride, not so much pride as to being better than other people, but the pride of mastering a craft. We've got this in and out breath that we don't make much use of. We breathe in, we breathe out, basically just enough to keep ourselves alive. But if you explore the breath, you begin to realize there's a lot more going on here. Here's where it's good to have the breath capture your imagination. What are the ways you conceive of the body, the conceive of the breath, 
your relationship to the mind and the body. Where are you in the body when you're breathing? Where is the breath? How does the breath come in? Or when the air comes in, does the breath energy start outside or does the breath energy start inside? It's got to start inside. This is one of the paradoxes. You, the breath energy spreads from a point inside, but it pulls the air in from the outside. So it's good to see how those two are related. Why? Because the more you can gain some control over the breath, the more you learn about the mind and about the body at the same time. But particularly about the mind. And John Lee says the breath is a mirror for the mind. You've got the breath smooth, and you can see your mind clearly there. Whatever's happening in the present moment, you see it clearly. And this is where it gets really interesting to see how the mind shapes its concepts. How different thoughts come into the mind. What are the stages by which they do this? This is something really worth knowing, because our thoughts have fooled us for so long. And here's our chance to see through their, their subterfuges, their tricks. So if you find yourself getting bored with a practice or tiring of the practice, it's a sign you're not paying careful attention, because the most important thing in your life is what your mind is doing right now. It makes a difference between long-term happiness and long-term pain. And so it only stands to reason that you want to know how the mind goes about making choices that would then lead to long-term pain. We, nobody wants it. Yet we keep doing it again and again and again. It's because, as I said, we don't know what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. Our values are all wrong. If you learn how to understand the workings of the mind, then we can begin to straighten out our values. So do your best to put the mind in a good place. That's a lot of learning how to look for the long term comes from having a sense of at least relative well-being right now. It's like the difference between someone who has no food and someone who has a good supply of food. If you have no food at all, all you can think about is the next meal. If you have a good supply of food, you're free to think about other things. The next meal is not so much of a problem. So breathe in a way that gives a sense of well-being right now, a sense of ease being right here, a sense of fullness being right here. How do you get fullness? Start with the part of the body that's sensitive as the breath comes in and goes out. And ask yourself, do you squeeze that part of the body when you breathe out? Do you stretch it when you breathe in? Would it be more comfortable if you just allowed it to just be there? Not changing as you breathe in, not changing as you breathe out. Don't squeeze anything right there. And after all, a sense of fullness will develop. And then think of that fullness spreading. See how long you can maintain it. See what destroys it. And if it seems to be destroyed, how do you get it back? As you do this, you both get a sense of well-being, and you begin to see what's going on in the mind. How the quick the mind is to forget. This is an issue of mindfulness. We have to keep reminding ourselves again and again and again, this is where we want to stay. And that requires a desire. So it gets back to that issue of generating desire. 
remind you, reminding yourself of why you want to stay. We all too often think of the processes of meditation being nothing but the present moment. But you've got to think about the long term, both the long term that you've been through so far and the long term that lies ahead of you. You think about the long term in the past, just to remind yourself, if you don't get your act together now, it's just going to be more of the same stuff over and over again. I know a lot of people who say that simply the thought of having to go through public school again is enough to make them not want to come back. And then you think about the long time ahead of you. What lies in wait? There was a channel just now. There's aging, illness, and death. We haven't gone past them. Are you prepared for them? This is how you prepare. Getting some control over the mind. I was talking today to someone who seemed to have a lot of trouble with this idea. He said, after all, the ultimate truth is that everything is in constant, right? So while well, you're trying to make the mind constant as you meditate, you're trying to take what is potentially stressful and make it easeful. Something that's out of your control, you want to bring it into your control. Now the constancy and the ease and the control are not absolute. But if you didn't have some control over these things, there would be no path. There would be no way out. We use things that are put together to get over to something that's not put together. Remember the Buddha's image of the raft. It's just basically twigs and branches and leaves, other things that you can find on this shore to get over to the other shore. You're not expecting some magic boat to come from the other shore to come pick you up. You take what you've got. In other words, you can't use nirvana to get to nirvana. You have to use fabricated things. But it works. Just as long as you put them together well and you hold on tight and you make the effort to go across the river. It can be done. It's simply a matter of wanting to do it enough. And then being as wise and discerning in acting on that desire. We all want happiness. We search for happiness. Sometimes there are people who say that the more you search for happiness, the more it runs away, so give up and it'll come to you. But that's not how it works. Some people say, well, they just don't search for happiness because your happiness makes other people miserable one way or another, so just don't search for happiness at all. That doesn't work either. There's always part of the mind that's looking for pleasure, looking for happiness. So the question is, how do we do it in an intelligent way? How do we do it in a compassionate way? So we cause no harm to ourselves, no harm to other people. It is possible. So it's largely a matter of taking your desire for true happiness and pointing it in the right direction, reflecting on what works, what doesn't work. What, when you've done it, seemed worth it? What, when you've done it, didn't seem worth it? And keep on moving in that direction of the, the greater happiness that you find when you give up lesser pleasures. Because insight is a value judgment. You know that sometimes the judging mind is is criticized. If you train it to be a wise judging mind, your judicious mind, then it's a large part of the path. <laughs>